Trevor. Yes, sir. How you doing, man? Very good. Good hey, to be here. Long time no see. I don't think I saw you. I haven't seen you since maybe yeah. the night after the last MOBA Awards. You had a gig in Glasgow. I oh, think. yes, and yes, I saw yes, you in the yes, 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 yes. That's, that's true. Yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to say with my girl in a restaurant. <laughs> if oh, you that, that, was, that, was, that was years ago. That was yeah. in Shoreditch, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. she was eyeing that. you up. I wasn't happy. <laughs> 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 so going, he's all right. Listen, he? you're the master, Trev. We know this. You're the master. You're the master. But listen, how is this? Is this weird? It's weird for me um, chatting to you on this sort of level in this capacity. Yes, yeah, it's just that official. This is these mics are big. It's, it's, it feels <laughs> official. But you know what? I'm 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 all happy about it, man. Because yeah. we go really way back. Far back. And um, we probably, we probably go further back than you actually remember. But I'll tell you. I remember you were on my show. Yes, yes. I remember yes, you yes, were yes. like I did. I'm not going to call you an intern. No, well, I was uh, I was like a. A stand-in broadcast assistant. We had Darren on the show. Yeah. Devon as well. Yeah. So they kind of took me under their wing at Radio yeah. One. And I remember thinking, because obviously you work throughout the week. Yeah. You know, lead up to the show at the yeah. weekend. And I remember thinking like Trevor's gonna come in like at some point during the week. I was thinking, this is this is Trevor Nelson. <laughs> He's gonna come in. And then Trevor walked in with the, the most amount of swagger into Did the I? Oh mate, mate. Like li like literally just strolled in. <laughs> All the women in the office are like, oh, Trevor, Trevor, Trevor. He strolls in, he says a couple of things as a as a bit of a chat. He's like, Listen, mate, you're on the good team, you're on the good team. And then he just well, walks out again, walks out. I'm just like I've met Trevor Nelson. It was, it was, just, <laughs> oh it was just a God. big deal. It was a know, big, do you know it was what? I never see it. Honestly, I've got to be honest with you. I get it, but you know, you know me. I wouldn't even remember that I said that yeah, or yeah. acted that. Well, I'm, I'm the same all the time. You know yeah, what I mean? You are. You are. I'm In the fairness same all to you, because people that I've met since are just like, "What's Trevor like?" I'm like, exactly what you hear, exactly <laughs> what you see. That is Trevor Nelson. Like that's what you, what you yeah, see is what the, you get. Straight it, up. Everything else is a, yeah, the only reason I say that, right? Honestly, it's. Everything else is an effort, man. Yeah. If you can't just be, I, I worked it out. If you can just be yourself, mm. work isn't half as hard, you know. Yeah. You just rock in and you just, you know, <laughs> do your thing. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I, I think, I think you and Melvin are yourselves. Mm. You know, yeah. I don't think you're putting anything on. So you know, try not to. You're try polite to. and he's naughty. <laughs> that's, that's that about that's sums, about sums, about it, up. sums yeah, it up. Yeah. All right. Now listen, as you as you know, uh, here at the motto, we like to give back. Whether right. that's through the amazing stories that our guests tell, or whether it's through the money that we get from sponsors, we uh, we donate that to charity, oh, charity good. of the guest good. choice. So good. that being said, what charity would you um, like us to donate on your behalf? Okay, too? I will say that very recently um, we lost a footballer, an ex-footballer, and I know a lot of people are saying oh, ex-footballers don't need money, but this guy played football in an era when it wasn't necessarily massive time. Ugo yeah. Ekio. Yes. Um, he became a Tottenham coach and yeah. just, just passed away. Aston Villa legend. Yes. His brother is a very, very close family friend. My brother-in-law and him literally grew up together. Really? He used to come around my house, play music, all that stuff. Mm. And I do a golf day that I, I do every year for fun. It's a fun golf day. Music on the course, speakers everywhere, jerk chicken. <laughs> and it's just for normal people. Anyone, yeah. who, anyone can play. It's not a celebrity thing. Yeah. And Ugo rocked up last year and played. And um, I think I mentioned, I saw him somewhere and I mentioned it to him. He just came, played, lovely guy. Massive guy, isn't he? And unit, yeah, he's yeah, yeah. Tall guy, really lean, athletic. It was a real shock that he passed away. So he's got a Just Giving page. Right. He wanted to start a children's charity and I gave all proceeds from my golf day to that. So Amazing. if you look it up, that, that's where I'd like the money to go because he never really saw his dream, you know, fulfilled and he, and he, and he went far too young. Yeah, very, very young. It yeah. was... Um, it was a shock, man. And he was loved as well. Yeah. Very, very loved. Very Legend loved. Played for England as well. Great player. Yeah. Um, changing the subject slightly, uh, back in 02, take you back to 02. Yeah. You were awarded an MBE. Yeah. Tell us about that. That's, do you know what? That's, it's weird. I'm going to be honest with you. Number one, I felt, I'm too young for an MBE. <laughs> what, what is this for? Yeah, I knew what it's for. It wasn't for music. What was it for? Everyone thinks it's for music. Mm. It was for volunteering. I right. did, um... You know, when you get, when, at the time I was getting really well known in the UK, I had that thing of, I had Radio 1 and MTV, and for R&B, that was huge, Colossal. you know what I mean? It was huge, yeah. and, you know. And I had a lot of influence, and you know, people writing in magazines about, you, you know, the most powerful man in black music, and they loved doing all them titles on yeah. it. But I was like, this isn't just a black thing. Yeah, I'm black. Yeah. Um, I could see my audience by going around the country time and time again, we're just young, 
all sorts of people. Yeah. Asian, black, white, all colors. And I just thought, if I get involved in something charitable, I want it to be for young people, not just... Period. Yeah, yeah. I did a lot with Hackney, and we can talk about that. I, yeah. I've, I've been a mentor, patron of a lot of things in Hackney. But I just wanted to do something that my listeners, my audience, you know, could benefit from. And it just came out of the blue. They came up with this volunteering thing called Millennium Volunteers, mm. where they got 10 well-known people right across the board. Nick Hancock was one. Okay. Um, yeah. June Sarpong was one. Yeah. Um, I can't remember every... Oh, um, Paul McCartney's ex-wife. Really? Before she was his wife. Uh, with, with one leg. Really? Yeah, she was one. And I was really impressed by her because yeah. when I met, I met her at Downing Street. And, I, and, and basically the idea was, you know, you go and you, you go to local um, areas around the country maybe and you, you're supportive of this initiative, which is 15 to 24-year-olds giving them an opportunity to become whatever they want yeah. to be. Yeah. And that's perfect for me. I wanted to be part of something that I would have wanted to be part of. So yeah. I was doing gigs all around the country, as you know. Every time I went to Nottingham, Manchester or something, I'd get there early, go and visit the local youth initiative place, yeah. encourage people, give out certificates, give out their volunteering hours, encourage them to volunteer. Completely under the radar. I didn't want anyone to know. I'm gonna be <laughs> honest with you. I, I did it because I felt I should, because life was good to me. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I did that for a couple of years, I think it was. And then you get a letter, f I got a letter through the post. I kept getting asked to come back and back and I, it became really demanding on my time. Yeah. But you know, I felt guilty. I was earning good money. I was living a really good life on, you know, on air and on telly. And I just felt, you know, these kids seemed to want me all the time. Yeah. And I got this letter and I was like, what does this mean? <laughs> would you be, it's, it's kind of a weird letter you get. You get a letter that says, would you be opposed to and I couldn't work out what it was. I obviously wasn't a post, so I went, I didn't say anything. And then the next minute, you find out you've got an MB by reading the newspaper. Wow. Is that happened? That's how it happens. No you way. find out, you don't, they don't tell you. Yeah. You, you, you find your name, literally, in, <laughs> in the public domain. And, um, and then there was that question of, I don't really believe in an empire massively. I've heard this from a lot of people that have been offered yeah, and maybe turned it down. I don't like the empire thing. Yeah. I don't like what it stood for back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but we're all here because of it. Absolutely. You know, so I accepted it because of my mum and dad. I thought that you know they never thought I would really become anything <laughs> because of my love of music. And it was like my my way of saying you know my dad lived in Saint Lucia. I sent him a picture. You Saint know, Saint Vincent. There you go, down the road, mate. Yeah, down the road, and, and it made them, you know, it's, it must be a nice feeling mm -hmm. if you're a parent, for your son to get a, an honour. So, I'm, you know, I'm happy with it. Yeah. It was, right. it was unusual, but I'm happy. So you spoke about your dad just then. Take us back to the beginning. Like, yeah. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Where I was, did it all start? I was born in Hackney, Lon East London. Um, born in Hackney Hospital, which is now Homerton Hospital. Yeah. I grew up in St Stokely Winton. Stokey, as Stokey. we called it. Yeah. Stokey. Stokey. Yeah, you know, grew up like, dare I say, I'm quite an old boy now, you know. Do you know what? Late I, was about, 60s, I was about to touch the early to touch 70s. On this. That was my growing up, man. From the moment that I, I met you, Trevor, you yeah. haven't aged one day. I one am. Day. Do you know how old I am? Let me guess. I'm going to say you're. I don't know how old you are. No, have I'm, a guess. Have a, guess. have a qualified guess. Rather, don't be flattering to me. No, be, no, well, I'm, I'm 37 now. Yeah, I'm, you're getting on, bruv. I'm getting on, but, you know. Ah. You know, I could pass as a 28. Yeah, there you go, there you go. You look like you're 25, 26. Come so on. if I'm 37, yeah, you're working it out. You've got to be at least, I'd say, you're definitely 50. Mm. I'd say 52, 53. Yeah, spot on. There you go. There spot you go. on. I'm there 53. Go. That's insane. It's I, I don't feel any different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, if, if I don't look different, I don't you feel don't different. different but don't. the only difference is in between the years, yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah. I'm, so, I'm the, the happiest point in my life right now. And um, I, even in my heyday of DJing and telly, I was not necessarily happy. Really? Yeah, we can talk about it. I wasn't, I wasn't that happy. Why? Because there, there was a moment where, yeah. there, was a, there was a point in time when, you know, I was at university, we're talking mm. like, you know, the, the late 90s, early 2000s, yeah. and your level <coughs> of status, well, you were like a, a, a music artist, you were like a superstar. Mm. You were a superstar DJ. Really? To, to you lot, but yeah, but who else? Are, who else are we yeah. you looking at? But I, like you got your Pete Tongs, you had your yeah, yeah. your Westwoods. Yeah. There was you. There yeah. was, but so that's you, you it's feel, all relative, you, though, isn't it? It's you, didn't all, feel, you didn't feel that. No, but it's all relative. This is what I'm going to say to you, Pete Tong. I looked upon as 
somebody, people, you know, people ask me mentors, people you look up to. Pete Tong's a man of few words. Mm. I have never, I've, I speak to Pete, I've never spoke, I don't think I've ever spoken more than a couple of minutes ever to Pete. Really? In all of my life. That's insane. Pete I've... Tong is that guy, honestly, he is, he, Pete's just like, you know, we've DJed in the same club, Pasha. We DJed there for a couple of years and I'd see him and we'd chat before, but again, it's all brief because our, people always wanting your attention, always talking yeah, yeah, at yeah. work. He's, he's a very quiet guy, he'd walk in. But Pete said something to me, um, early 90s when he, he joined Radio 1 I didn't really know him before Radio 1 mm. but he joined Radio 1 and was at some award show and I think he went up and gave an award at, or received an award and he walked past my table and he said you'll be on Radio 1 soon amazing like that he just said that I don't know why he said that um, so you were at Kiss at the time yeah I was at Kiss yeah yeah. 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 and um, I don't know I, I just felt that he was a superstar because of the music that he represented house music was everybody's music it was huge yeah but pete came from soul music yeah all, everyone came from soul yeah, music yeah, mate yeah. don't be fooled yeah. most most djs came from soul music because yeah, yeah, that was yeah. the music when they were growing up of the day that was the music being played in clubs but i stuck with it a lot of my friends um went for financial reasons to dance music went mm. for drug reasons to dance music yeah. they took their first d and that was it <laughs> you know what i mean i remember danny ramplin <laughs> sitting next to me in um a kiss fm pirate meeting and Danny was called Danny Rampo at the time. He used right. to wear match. He, the guy was a soul boy. This guy wore like soul boy clothes. <laughs> and he used to have the little soul boy haircut and he had some nice tunes. You know, yeah. I, I always knew what every DJ tunes. I just think something, he's got some tunes. That guy's got tunes. We, the kids' early meetings were ridiculous. <laughs> really? Honestly. And then one day I was sitting next to Danny and Danny said, I'm starting a club called Shum. Um, it's all about house music. I'm going to be selling my soul tunes. And I went, what? He said, yeah, it's anything you, you, you ain't got that I might have and that. And we, uh, but this is the weird conversation we're having. I'm like, what? <laughs> I couldn't imagine selling my, any of my music. Yeah, and Danny yeah. was, and I went to one of the first nights he did of Shum and you couldn't go from one extreme to the other. Mm. I mean, he went from playing obscure LA boppers, soul, soul music to acid house with strobes going. And the guy I had seen a few months ago to the guy who was DJing was, was unrecognizable <laughs> really? but he made a huge career out of it yeah. and he was real about it at the end of the day and he did some great things with his career but that wasn't for me it mm. wasn't for me I, I was still stuck in 200 capacity clubs earning 150 pound a week <laughs> yeah. right for a good five years yeah and you know and that's you know that's the way and I, and I think that stood me in good stead I mm. think that's kept my feet on the ground throughout, you know. So it's all relative. Yeah, what I'm yeah. trying to say to you is, while you thought I was a superstar, I was still in a 300 capacity club sometimes. And them guys were tearing up Ibiza. Yeah, And yeah. buying but, villas. And I, I know okay. what you mean. Yeah, yeah, I, know yeah. I, know, I, know I know what you mean. I know what you're saying. I know what you mean. It's all relative. Yeah. And it, everything doesn't come down to money. Mm. And this, this is the point I always, I always believed that you were watching. I always knew, I knew every step of the way. I'm, I'm not trying to be a scientist. When I went on Radio 1, I knew what I wanted to do. Mm. When I went on MTV, I knew what I had to do, not what I wanted to do, right. what I had to do. Which was? Which was not be a VJ. Yeah. VJs used to stand up and, and just talk banal stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then throw the, to a video. The early days of MTV, it was yeah. quite European, wasn't look, it? Like look, look fantastic. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. looked fantastic. Models. They all looked like models. Yeah. They all looked like models with funny accents. <laughs> And they'd stand there, rock from side to side on their heels or whatever. All well, the hair was amazing. Guys and girls, same. And they'd talk talking really weird accents and da da da. It's the MTV Europe, and this is the new video from Fuji's. Yeah. And I used to look at that and go, okay, I get it. Yeah. They're not playing our videos, and no one's telling me anything that I don't know already. I want, you know, you know what I mean? I could go, I could speak for an hour on all these subjects, yeah, any, yeah. any, any, any one of them. Of There's course. so many stories yeah. I've had to keep in. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But, all right, but um, go, let's take it back to okay. school days, just yeah. briefly. Yeah. How did you first get, how did you first get the music bug? Um, so at 13, I started buying records with my pocket money and dare I say, my school dinner money <laughs> and my bus fare. I even walked two and a half miles to school. Really true. To save 10p. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. Was it 10p back it then, yeah? It was 10p back then. <laughs> 10p. It was my thing, man. Mm. I was quite a geek. And um, 
by the time I got to 17, I had a few records. I probably bought my first, I bought, I know, I know what the first album I bought was. I was probably a little, a little bit older than 13. I was definitely older because I got a bus down to our price records because I bought an Our album for nine, yeah I bought an album for one ninety nine. yeah and it was Roy's album I got all the way home on the bus and I opened it and it was a country and western album inside I was gutted <laughs> I went back and they didn't have a copy so I bought Earth Wind and Fire's greatest hits nice. so that was my first album nice yeah and you know every Powerful. tune was a banger Powerful. every yeah. tune was a banger on that and I was like rinsed the hell out of that the, the record's like this shape now <laughs> and I still got it so um, one thing that did happen that changed my life was we had a disco Right. And we had to, we had no girls in our school though. Of course. So we had to go to the local girls' school, like like a, <laughs> a group of us. This was, that sounds fun, Trev. That was not fun. <laughs> so we went to the convent where my sisters went to. No and way. we were looking, we're, will you come to our school disco? And I'm like, dude, you know what? I said, in them days you had to, you couldn't dance on a dance floor unless you were with a girl. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you had to ask girls to dance. <laughs> Mate, I immediately put my hand up and said, can I be the DJ? Because I've got records, right? And I've never DJ before. Right. So that was my first gig, the right. school disco. And I've got little Kodak Instamatic pictures of that. The dance floor was ram. Yeah, I played a bit of Level 42, Cool and the Gang, Earth, Wind and Fire. Nice. And that was it. Yeah. I got the bug. From that day, from that day, I wanted to own a sound system and... That was it. I did, that's I did. what it was about back then. Like you had yeah. your own sound. Your sound would like be. That's what it was about. It. Yeah. Fundamentally, I started a sound system called with some local Mad Hatters. Of course. And the reason it was called Mad Hatters, a stupid name, but um, I just wanted everyone in Hackney to know I wasn't a reggae sound. Mm. So we started doing little parties, um, and little blues parties. I was were poorly attended at first. I mean, the f and you know. 50 people, 70 people, mm. but they, I had the brainwave to make them drinks free. Really? So it was five pounds to get in, drinks free all night. Okay, got you, got you, got you, got you. Think about it. Yeah, five yeah, Five yeah, pounds yeah, yeah. to get in, drinks free yeah. all night. Really. It's big, it's a big look. It's I didn't make look. any money, but I had the best parties because <laughs> the drink was obviously cheap. Yeah. And um, we never ran out, right. ever ran out because people, I made the music so good that people didn't want to lose their spot. They'd all rush to the bar, have a drink, Come run to it, get a spot. Cause yeah. you know, them parties were, they were tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was all, it was, oh, my brain was always <laughs> thinking, always thinking. And we, we, you know, play the music, make them party, make them party. And the next time they would go to a bar, they want a soft drink. Mm. Cool down, <laughs> I'm not alcoholic. And we got a bit of a reputation. And then one day I was doing a party and there's a guy who used to come in to the record shop I finally ended up working in. It's a long story, I'm jumping hoops in there. <laughs> Let me explain, I worked in a shoe shop and at lunchtime, I closed the shoe shop up when it was the busiest period to go and buy records at the record <laughs> shop. So the guy in the record shop said, you know what, do you want to work? Do you want to, you, you know, you know a lot about music for your age. And I said, well, yeah, I'm obsessed with that. And he said, he said, well, we run a, an import company. Do you want to work as an importer? Right. So well, what does that mean? He says, well, you know, you call America basically every night. They tell you what new tunes are out. You order them, you race to Heathrow Airport in a van, Wow! you count them, you pick them up, and you sell them to all the independent record stores in London. Yeah, because back in the day, getting a record on import was like a big deal. Big deal. Massive. So I was like, this is my job. I've got a hard on. <laughs> this is my dream job. This is my dream job, surely. I didn't even care the money. Money was shit. Yeah. didn't bother me. Yeah. I took the job. I'm on the phone. Yeah, hey. Hey man, this is still yeah, yeah, Win, Winfield Records. Yeah man, hey, this shit is blowing up, boy. I'm saying, what is Public Enemy, man? You heard of Public Enemy? Wow. Public Enemy, you want to hear it? He take the phone, put it to a speaker. I'm not joking. Are you serious? This is how crude it was. It's just like, can you imagine <laughs> just the noise. bomb squad, Hank Shockley? <laughs> I'm saying, what is that? He's like, man, it, this shit is moving in New York. Right. You need? I say, give me fifty. Nah, bro, you need more than that. Because it was a risk, you had to take yeah. a risk. I say, right, give me two hundred. Right. Okay, that's the start. And literally, that's how it happened. Acid wow. house, all of this stuff. I race to the airport, get all these new tunes. Race quickly, hear them back at my office. Race to the shops, and then other companies were doing the same thing. So it was a competition. You're racing through London, and it was the best job in the world. Because so this is what eighty-eight, eighty-nine. No, this is before, way before. It's eighty-five. Before really? Eighty-five. Yeah, eighty-five. That coincided very. 
um, soon with me getting on Kiss FM. I was going to say, how did that transition you into? That was probably the biggest changing point in my life. It, remember, this is still a hobby for me. Mm. Now it's a job. Importing is actually a job. So I'm actually, yeah. I didn't realize I'm working in the music industry at the lowest possible right. level. Right. But I'm in the industry. And I was doing a little blues party um, in Leytonstone in a block of flats. <laughs> I was in playing there and there was a guy called Tosca who was in there. Tosca was one of the original founders of Kiss FM. It was him, Gordon Mack Gordon and Mack, George yeah. Power. Yeah. Right? And Tosca used to buy records in the record shop. I ended up managing for a little while or assistant managing in Hackney. And I used to Tosca used to come and I used to look at him and go, Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. when you're in the record shop, you are just you just, you hear the yeah. chat in a record shop, man. They just, yeah. that, they butcher everybody. Everybody, everyone's no good. Everyone's, <laughs> you're better than everyone. You know, meet this tune, what is he playing that for? And anyway, he came looking for me. Some said, Tosca's looking for me. I said, what do you want? <laughs> a bit like that, what do you mm. want? Mm. And then I saw him, he said, do you want to be on Kiss FM? And Kiss is like, you know, on the underground. It's, yeah, it's, Kiss it's a is a couple deal. of months old. Right. It's a couple of months old. I knew Norman Jay was on it and I knew Paul Anson was on it and that was enough for Sold. me. Yeah. That was enough for me. And I used to drive a Mini I used to hold my aerial, listen to this station mm. as it started, you know. I said, hell yeah. He said, I'm gonna introduce you to Gordon Mack. I heard you at the party the other night, really good, you know, you know your tunes and all this stuff. And I was going, cause that's how Kiss was. If you knew your tunes, someone would tell someone yeah. that they spotted someone and that's how it, people got on. It was right. really like that. Yeah. And um, I met Gordon Mack, who, what a character. <laughs> and um, you know, he gave me the graveyard shift. So basically the station was only on on the weekends, Friday, I think it was Friday to Sunday. And I got the Sunday night one till four show <laughs> in the morning. The worst time <laughs> you could imagine. But I treated my show like it was nine o'clock till midday. You have to, you have to. I, I treated it so seriously, yeah. I cannot tell you. So no. how long were you at Kiss for? In total, 10 years. Yeah. Five years as a pirate, five years legal. Mm. And I saw a lot, you know, it was the most exciting time of my whole musical career. Really? When we were pirates, yeah. Because we did it all for nothing. I look forward to that show probably more than I look forward to any show I've done since. I've heard some crazy stories about them days. Yeah, Kiss. it was crazy. It was crazy. Like your Brandon Blocks and like- It was crazy, the whole, the whole thing. <laughs> The whole pirate era in the 80s was really crazy, unhinged, you know, anything could happen. Your worst enemy wasn't always the DTI, it could be another station trying to take you off air. Wow. There's stories about people with dogs on rooftops protecting your aerials <laughs> and people sabotaging you because you yeah. were getting too, you know. Um, but it becoming legal was the one day my dad and me shared a glass of champagne. Really? over music and he said I said dad I'm going to be a legal DJ this is the first time I felt official yeah so it was September 1990 first show on legal kiss we were well out of our depth we had no idea what commercial radio was <laughs> capital radio was the biggest yep. and baddest station commercial station on the planet in terms of revenue we, really, we, we wanted to hit a million listeners that was our our big goal i remember first and foremost we got there we had a really cool advertising campaign but i think we had we kept everybody who was a pirate initially and that was a mistake right not everyone was cut cut out for yeah. it you yeah. know i yeah. find, you know i got there they put me on the board of directors for some reason i was wow. the only dj on the board of directors i was like 25. when you look at kiss now because obviously mm. i'm on kiss now yeah. and my boss was uh, given the task of getting rid of a lot of the old school DJs. Of um, I've heard some crazy stories about people coming in, in with baseball bats well, and well, you know, like I'm, motorbike I'm helmets and I'm stuff. I'm sure I know go. who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, it, yeah. was, it was a crazy yeah. time. Because, because honestly, I can't tell you how big a deal the Kiss Thing story is mm. to dance music in this country, yeah. dance music around the world, people who make music. Mm. It was such a big deal that people were invested emotionally. Yeah. You know, when a, when a man has sat on a, on a rooftop to protect the station, yeah. and then you're talking about him losing his show, you can understand that maybe he might be a little bit passionate <laughs> about not losing his show. When a guy, you know, I've given out flyers at four in the morning in the pouring rain for no money for that station. Yeah. You know, I, we, there's a lot we did for that station. So 
it's it was all right for me, you know, teacher's pet kind of thing, you know, getting a daytime show and all sorts of things. But for other fringe DJs, it was tough mm. for them to realise that th their little babies become this big behemoth. Is that the right word? Yeah, of a, of a station. Yeah, and, yeah. and we had to realise when you go commercial, everything changes. It does. You've got to make money. You've got to make money. This isn't about... We used to make money to survive, not mm. to, you know, no DJ got paid. Now it has to make money. Yeah. And it, it took a long time to get it right. So when you finally left mm. uh, KISS, do you feel like you left it in a good place? I, I, <laughs> I think when I left KISS, I felt like, it, the funny thing is, I left KISS in transition. Yeah. I, I, think, it's in, I think it was in a, in a more solid place after five years of experimentation mm. to be, the platform was there for it to become a successful commercial radio station. Yeah. The first five years were really difficult, I think, for mm. KISS. And incidentally, I left KISS to go to a station that was again in transition. You spoke about in transition. Pete Tong before, like, yeah. talking about, yeah. to you about the whole Radio 1 thing. Yeah. So how did, that, how did that all come about? So I did club promotions, and I realised that we had this really bad exposure for... If I had a house tune, for example, and I was promoting Juliet Roberts or, or Masters at Work or something, yeah. I've got 1,200, I've got 15, I've got 2,000 DJs in the UK that want a copy, that all claim to be a resident at a club. Right. If I've got an R&B tune, pff, I had about 50. Really? Genuine, I'm a resident at a club. Maybe 250, I've, you know, I play a little R&B on my show. You know, it, I, I'd press 1,000 copies and I'd be stuck with 750. That's why so many R&B and hip hop promos ended up in record stores right because they were doing the promo for us yeah so you'd literally give it to them and record shops will sell them yeah. but yeah. they're doing promo for you and so that's why what sort of time period is this mid 90s this is mid 90s yeah this is this is why you saw that so often mm -hmm. now now you think about it yeah. and people were always selling promos and so i knew i needed this music needs to be national so i went to radio one i got the gig and i knew this is the platform mate this is where it goes this is where we got to take this. Um, and, and that was my thing. I was like on an absolute mission. So once you got on Radio 1, yeah. um, that's when, I caught you just the, the end of KISS, so I kind of yeah. saw the transition between KISS and, Radio and, then, 1. and then Radio yeah. 1. And wow. then while you're at Radio 1, obviously I went off to university. Yeah, which you is were, life, life safe. Life safe. Like, ra you on Radio 1, you yeah. in Westwood, but you specifically yeah. Yeah. was life changing for most of the people yeah. that were there. At unis. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we listened to you like religiously, yeah. like Rhythm Nation, like you on a Saturday. It was just, it was just religious. You listened to Trevor Nelson, but how did the TV stuff come about? I mean, you you have to think. I was on radio when Destiny's Child first came out, yeah. And these girls come in, and I'm like one of only two or three radio interviews they've got to do. And I found that with a lot of artists, they'll be coming up to Radio One, and they'll go to Choice, and they'll go to Kiss, and that that might be it in London, yeah. and they'll and they'll fly out. Maybe Galaxy up. They won't. Yeah, they won't get any. They'll do yeah. ISDN line yeah. interviews. They won't get any TV. And I looked at MTV many times, and I said, "What are you doing? <laughs> like, really? Like, why are you pushing us this stuff all the time? Mm. We were watching the box. We were watching channels that might play Buster Rhymes every half hour, maybe. Yeah. We were watching anything, but." Um, there was that one hip hop show on MTV. Oh, Yo MTV yeah, Raps. Yeah, Yo MTV Raps, yeah, the legendary yeah, show yeah. that even got a bit watered down towards the We had BET Video Soul for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, stuff well. like that. Yeah. But it was it was all over the place. Yeah, you, yeah. you you had to sort of Yeah. And MTV did a sort of a, a more show, some love song show. Oh, which that was, was really with, um, cheesy. Yeah, late at Italian night. girl, Italian girl sort of a you know, it was all a bit cheesy. And I just thought, okay. I now that. I got a call from a guy who looked after my voiceovers because I didn't have an agent, he said, look, I know someone at MTV who says you should go for, a, you know, an audition. I said, shut up, I'm not a model. <laughs> and, I've, you know, I've got no hair. You know, I've got no Maxwell hair. I ain't got that going, I ain't got no dreads. I've got no, I got no look, man. What are you talking about? MTV's all about a look. So I went up there. But that was your look, that's your look. Yeah, though. I know, but I went up there and I'm being, what you don't know, and what a lot of people don't know, I actually went up there a year or two before. Really? For an audition that I couldn't take because I was working full time. But I went what anyway. What was that, what was that? This is for, this is when Richard Blackwood joined. Right. I think it was the time he joined, it must have been that yeah, time. Yeah. And I went like a militant. 
<laughs> I, this is every word is true. I sat there because I knew I couldn't do the show even if they offered it to me. I said, I kind of, the guy started saying, right, I'm going to start filming. I said, what's wrong with you guys, man? Why aren't you showing more black videos? Mm. And he's like, well, you know, which, that's, that's the idea kind of what we, yeah, but, and I just went into one. I just kept he looked at me like don't you want this yeah yeah I, yeah I know I couldn't do it anyway so I just made my case and I went <laughs> and I went this is true and I went seriously yeah I went they filmed me some nonsense and I went and I, I know I can get it and then I saw um, Richard appeared on MTV and I think oh good I, doing I, the same show doing a show he was on MTV right. doing select yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and then he, he was doing something called bass believe it or not really that went around Europe it was a bit weird it was okay. they were trying to be appealing to the whole of Europe yeah Two years later, I get this call from, from Jeff Young, it was. And I said, I'm not going up there. I ain't going up there. He said, no, you should go, you should go, because a woman is, who's told me you should go up there used to work at Radio 1. Right, so I who thought, was that? Oh, Christine Bohr. Okay. Christine Bohr, for about a year, was head of programmes. And she, they said they needed an R&B and hip-hop show or something like that. And she said, I think I know the perfect guy for it. She never worked with me at, at Radio 1, but I knew of her. Yeah. She left famously to go to MTV. So I went and I felt a bit more confident about it. Mm. But, and I thought, oh, but I don't like Maxwell. When I went up there, there was a guy in the, the dressing room who looked just like Maxwell <laughs> waiting to do an interview. So I'm like, see, they're just setting me up. So I went up there, they said, do you want to, you know, and I basically did a really average audition. Mm. And Sherwin, who became my, my literally off camera partner there, yep. was filming me. Sherwin Gardner? Sher no, Sherwin Beckford. Beckford, okay. Yeah, who ended up being my director, was filming me. And I just thought, okay. And he says, you sure you don't want to do it again? I said, I've got a bit of a cold. No, not really. Got a call <laughs> next day. You got the show. Boom. Really? Next day? The moment I got that call, or the next week or whatever, the moment I got that call, I absolutely knew my life was going to change forever. I absolutely, 100% knew it, almost to a T what was going to happen. I, I'm, I, I, it was as clear as day. Because How if, could you have known that? How? Because I've studied it, haven't I? I've right. been at a record company. I've been at, uh, at Imports. I've seen what we need. I've seen mm. what we haven't got. Mm. I've been. I've been trying to plug records myself. I'm. I'm. You know. I'm in. I'm totally so ingrained in this world of music. Yeah. I know this is sounding all boring and technical, but that's how it was for yeah. me. At that point, it didn't come as a surprise to me. Mm if we made this show work, what the impact would be, even though MTV at the time had a very small subscription, you know, subscribers, you know, Sky wasn't as big as it is yeah, now. Yeah. So, but I knew anyone who's anyone who heard this show was on, the way we used to look around for Buster Run videos and everyone was the same. I knew I'd have a captive audience, even if people didn't like me. So knowing that, it. knowing that, did you have, did you go in there with an agenda? You knew exactly what you had to do? Absolutely. What, what, where was your head at? Absolutely. First of all, I wondered how I was going to do telly. I'd never done it before. <laughs> so I said to them, who's going to teach me? And they went, just do it, man. And I was like, I've never done TV before. So, um, so how did you learn that? Because well, I, I remember well, you giving me some advice yeah, like years down the line. You just learn yourself. Yeah. And I just, I cleared my mind very quickly and I thought, shit, I've got to, I've got to think of something. Because I know, from my experience, what you say will stick. Mm. So I came up with a name which was a name that was doing the rounds a little bit amongst the cooler people. Like if someone said, you know, um, what'd you do this weekend? I went to this party, man. What was it saying? Man, it was the lick. It was the lick. You know what I mean? It Even if you lick. didn't know what it meant, you yeah. kind of got the vibe. And then it was yeah. quite sexual as well. And yeah, it was yeah, quite yeah. sexy. And I thought it's a short, sharp word. That was a good idea. Right. So they said, we like that. Um, and then the idea of sitting down and not standing up. Mm so you could be different. And the idea that I was a radio DJ, so my voice, when the camera's off me, because I looked at the first few recordings we did and I hated looking at myself, it just didn't want to be on camera. Seriously? I hated it, yeah, I, I sat there, I remember the first show and I was like this, I was looking, I was married at the time and my wife didn't, she wasn't even interested, she was reading the magazine. So I was looking going like, oh my God, no. And they filmed me really dark and everything, so I said, we came up with the idea of just moving the camera off mm. me and me continuing to talk. Yeah. So it's one minute you're looking at a TV show, then it's like radio. Because I do believe that people who listen to specialist shows listen with a different ear. Yeah. When you watch telly, you're kind of distracted. There's so mm. much going on. And then we put stupid things like a shirt up. Just wrap to people, what, what are they doing? What's I just that remember about? the light, the light. And the, yeah, and a the light. Shape, and a, yeah, it was, just, it, was just, <laughs> it was just moody, but yeah. it was cool. And it, MTV, anything goes. You make a mistake filming at MTV and it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> you meant true. to do that, didn't you? You meant to drop the camera, didn't you? Yeah, it's MTV, isn't it? It's cool. And um, I knew, honestly, and, 
and I don't mean this egotistically at all. I knew because of how starving we were. Yeah. I knew I had to come correct. So I knew it wasn't just a jokey, jokey thing. You've got to give some history, some context. I knew that half the videos, when we said flashback or something, we said, who remembers, and we flash back to a video that I have never seen <laughs> because I've played that song for years, yeah. but because it's American, we'd never seen a video. Yeah. And people, I knew people by that. And I remember one thing I said to MTV was, will we get MTV hip hop news? Right, yeah. And they went, yeah, you can tap into any MTV news. Anything we got in America. I said, anything? Said, yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> because we didn't get enough of that either. Opportunities were it was endless. All, it was all, no internet. So mm. it was all like hearsay. And, and we ran with it, man. And it was the best ride. So that being said, you've got this platform now. You know what mm. you've got to do. Who do you think benefited from, you know, your, the platform that you had? All of that. Artists, like what? Because you brought through so many people at that point. Yeah, I think, I think what we did, and I think the combination of the Radio One show and um, MTV was we initiated more UK releases of American songs. Because a hit was in, because a song was a hit in America, didn't mean it get, gets released in the that's UK. True. Didn't yeah. mean that, and that's what people have to understand. Yeah. Loads of songs in America that were hits did ne never got released in the UK because record companies said didn't believe they knew yeah. how to market, yeah. promote them. All of a sudden we're giving them video opportunities, we're giving them interview opportunities. I was interviewing so many people on Radio One and then on MTV and they're yeah. like, damn, we just did you at Radio <laughs> One and now you're on MTV. I said, yeah, that's how it is. <laughs> and you know, but we, that, it, was, it was important not to take the piss. Mm. I knew I was in a powerful position. It was really important. But then you had to balance it because we were in a ghetto fabulous age. I couldn't this be this humble, humble. Bling. Yeah, it was in the age of bling. I couldn't be this humble, humble t-shirt wearing guy forever. So occasionally we, we jazzed it up a bit. If I'm staying in a hotel doing a lit party in, in, in Sweden and it's the baller suite, we'll film in there. <laughs> you, you know, because people, they, they liked that aspiration. Mm. You know, all the videos were a million dollars. It's no point you looking like 10 pence yeah. when they, you come off a video. I mean, we sometimes went, how can you follow that video? Hype Williams. Yeah. But it was a great ride. And the way I, the way I think I took it around the UK was the idea of the lick parties. And Which were legendary. But they were legendary by default. How do I, you mean? I walked into MTV and said, okay, we've got this show. It's going to be called The Lick. How are you going to promote it? Are we going to do trailers on the air? I said, yeah, but no one I know watches MTV. <laughs> so none of the hip hop and R&B community watch MTV, so they're not going to know it's on. So mm. are we going to do billboards? I was a bit naive. Mm. We're going to do big billboards, you know, like Piccadilly Circus. Yeah. No. So obviously as a promoter, club promoter, I thought, well, a great way of getting the word out there is to, to do flyers. Mm. If you're doing a venue that holds a thousand people, we do 10,000 flyers. That means 9,000 people don't come, but they have a flyer. Yeah. And on the flyer, we put the show times, we put there's something going on on MTV, you yeah. know what I mean? A show called The Lip, my black face on there, <laughs> you know? And it was, it was, <laughs> and it worked. It worked, it just worked. You, um, you were a trailblazer. Thank you, and MTV Base started on my watch as well. There you go. People forget that we actually were on, there was no MTV Base when we started, it started because yeah. there was so much heat on the lick, they thought we could do this 24 seven. Now, can I just say, you gave me, uh, when I joined MTV, I think I joined mm. in 2007, and you gave me the name Ricky Hollywood Williams. Yes. <laughs> Which is stuck, it's stuck. Yeah, I they think still, it's suited. They still call me that on kids, I think it's suited, I think it's suited, man. So thank you for that. Thank, thank you, no for problem. That. But what I will say is, um, I think Susan Eunice used to work on your show, Yemi Bonero yes. as well. Yes. I think they said in its original format, yeah. I was the only person, because you never missed a show. You mm. never missed a lick show, never yeah. missed a lick record. I was the only DJ to, uh, the only presenter to, to present the lick show in its original format. That's true. Apart from you. That is true. I completely <laughs> forgot. I did, I did one episode. Why wasn't I, was I abroad? I think you were abroad. You couldn't make it back. I tell you, I was cussing, you know. <laughs> uh, but, 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 you know, part of me, no, honestly, Ricky, Part of me thought, okay, you'll be the next presenter of the lick. That's what I thought. And in mm. the back of your mind, you must have maybe thought that. No way. All right. No way. Okay, but, no way. but I figured MTV will always have a show like the lick. I yeah. figured after 12 years of us doing that and, and all the good it did, including latter years, talking to Grime MCs, one-to-ones yep. -one with Dizzy, Chip when he was yep. a U, Tinchy, yep. we did all of that, Kano, there's need for a show like that. Yeah. I was pretty shocked. Not, not so much that they ended the lick, 
because I knew that was going to happen. Yeah. Unceremoniously, my ad. Well, I was talk, on holiday. Well, talk to me about that. How, how did the whole MTV dream end? I'm not. I'm not classily, to be honest. Because I don't. I don't remember it feeling like you were. You know that you left. It just felt like it just ended. It did just end. I was on holiday. I got a call and licks finished. That was it. No card. No goodbyes. No nothing. Crazy. Nothing. And. I just thought, <laughs> I didn't do it for, no disrespect, I didn't do it for a leaving do. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and the accolades. Because I had a leaving do. I know who I did it. I did it for you, mate. Yeah. I did it for people like you, honestly. And if I really meant that, who gives a shit? Yeah. But I still think we did so much good work there. We spread it around the world, outside of North America, big time, and they could have shown us a bit more love. Yeah. And, you know, let us handle a leaving Properly. I mean, we did stuff on air, mm. but it was, you know, it was, it was with a really weird sense of, I'm out of here, man. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, you know, that being said, you know, you've inspired a, a generation of broadcasters and presenters and yeah. artists. So, you know, it's not all bad. No, it, that's what I mean. Yeah. I'm, I am, the, I am so thankful, yeah. you know, and I'm thankful that you say that because that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. I'm, and I mean that, and it sounds gorgon but it's true <laughs> and i think my timing was spot on i joined at the right time yeah, yeah, yeah. you know i really yeah. did and um yeah you know youtube but, youtube kicked mtv's butt man that's the problem <sighs> yeah it did didn't it M it really did kick yeah. mtv's butt but mtv still should have maintained an urban show mm. really because our music is, is a different kind of flavor a different kind of sheen you want to hear what people got to say. You don't want to have to look all over the internet to, to piece things yeah. together. Once, I still think it would have been an appointment to, to, to view. I think you and Melvin could have done it. I think yeah. it, it would have been an appointment to view. I yeah. really do. And I just think they should have had the balls. We proved it, that it can work. They should have had the balls to do it. Yeah, yeah. Listen, there's so much more that we could talk about. Like, so so much, more. much more. We're going to definitely have to have a part two of this. We scratched the surface, <laughs> mate. We, we, yeah, I, you haven't even got me swearing yet. I, I, I thought you were going to get me swearing. <laughs> But no, well, it's listen, an honour, mate. We, an honor. Got, we have to end with um, we've yeah. got these four-step questions that sure, we've asked. no problem. Um, so the first one is, what is the biggest misconception about Trevor Nelson, about yourself? What is the biggest misconception about me? Um, that I probably wear silk pyjamas <laughs> and listen to Joe C in my bedroom <laughs> before I make love to my missus. Because <laughs> none of the above is the truth. <laughs> Just so you know, I would say, I'm like everybody else when I go to bed, commando in summer, maybe boxers in winter, and sex happens at half time in between football matches, just like every other bloke, yeah? Just like every other bloke, 15 minutes will suffice, yeah? I'm not Mr. Lover. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but you know what I mean. I mean, it's, I, hear you, I hear, I hear, fellow DJs continually going. I reckon Trevor Nelson. I reckon he. <laughs> I reckon he's got silk pajamas. I reckon he's got, you know, white sofas everywhere. And I reckon he's, you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. I don't listen to much music at home at all. Really, not at all. Crazy. All right. Next question. When was the last time you did something for the first time? Um, the last time I did something for the first time was, I would say, uh, a few months ago, and this is so basic, I mowed the lawn. <laughs> I the mowed, first time ever? I, yeah, I had, I, I've, I've, moved, I've lived in six different houses in my time, and I've had gardens at least four of them, and I've never, ever been a gardener, and now I'm so happy... I get peace in the garden by mowing the lawn. It's quite therapeutic, isn't it? It's beautiful for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And I keep fish. Yeah? Yeah. It's peaceful, man. <laughs> Trevor, man, you kill me. You kill me. I'm serious. Um, next question. One person that you think we should interview on the motto on this on this podcast. Charlie Sloth was on recently. Yeah. He said he said you. Oh, that's nice of him. He's a big fan. Yeah. Charlie's a good guy, you know. Yeah. There don't Very good guy. misconceptions about Charlie. Daniel Kalua. Who's that? He's a black actor who is a very talented guy. He's just been in a really good film. And he was he's a guy who was in the film opposite Rowan Atkinson when Rowan Atkinson did that. Oh, what's the this, what's this spy film? He played some agent. Uh, not Johnny English? Yeah. Right. He was a, he was a sidekick. Okay. So okay. Daniel Kalua, just remember I said that name. All right, okay. He's a good guy. He's and, funny. Um, finally, the big one. Yeah. What is your motto? What is Trevor Nelson's motto? Well, my motto is not aspirational. It is not some massive, oh, that's gonna be ringing in my ears. It's real talk. 
Shit is always waiting <laughs> around the corner. Be prepared. It's good. Very, very motto. good. Very, very That's good. That's my motto. <laughs> and you know what? why I say that? It's because no matter how, how high you're riding, there's always going to be something that's going to knock you down. And if you're not ready, you won't be riding anymore. You've got to be able to handle the, yeah. There's always something that stops you in your tracks and you have to, a hurdle you have to get over. You always think, oh, we've arrived. Yeah. Yeah. You so, get what I mean? It's so true. So and true. it's all and, and that's not a motto anyone's told me that's from life experiences <laughs> mate there's always shit and you know and it, it's kind of it, the, the double up to that is treat people how you want to be treated mm. because this industry that is another one I would say this industry is so big yet so small people, you're going to meet people again aren't you you always meet people yeah. again and if you treat people like a cock yeah when you know when, when, when 10 years ago all of a sudden mm. they're directing you yeah it's crazy it's they're crazy. directing you stage managing you floor managing you yeah yeah, uh, or, they're, or they're an artist that re reached out to you and then they make it big, and you. Yeah, you know. but that's that's up to you if you don't. That's that's they got to take that. But you yeah. know what I mean. If yeah. you acted like the big I am, first impressions are so. Look at you. You the first time I walked in, you remember exactly what I said. <laughs> True. You know, you might have said, "Yeah, he had a lot of swag. He gave it the large and walked out." I expected that. Or you might have said, "What a cop." <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's. No, but it, it is first impressions, yeah. Ricky. My first impressions of you were always, I remember, you, you know, you're just, I don't know if you're here today, gone tomorrow. That's probably why I didn't spend an hour sitting there with you. But mm. I think as we went on, I spoke to you a bit more. You know what I mean? And when you got to MTV, it was slightly different. Oh, gosh, you've made it here. Yeah, yeah. You know, or, or you, you got into Kiss. It's like, wow, because mm. you used to be at One Extra. Yeah. You yeah. know, a lot of people don't know that. Yeah, it's true. It's a lot true. of people don't know you and Melvin went One Extra. Yeah, yeah. They missed that. They did, they did. <laughs> but listen, Trev. You're an absolute legend. I'm sure you hear that a lot. Absolute you, pleasure, mate. We'll do it again, Abs yeah? Absolute pleasure, of All course. Right. I'm glad Trevor you're doing Nelson. well, mate. Trevor Nelson, everyone.